consumerism. I've already pointed out how the conveyor of consumerism is now putting us as the product in my article, Mark of the Beast. But I started reading an interesting book from the 50s that was recommended to me and would like to delve further into the concept around it and the marketing of it. The Hidden Persuaders by Vance Packard. He's the author who wrote that special book I refer to a lot, The People Shapers. So I thought it was about time I read this one too. It's about marketing. More specifically, the techniques and strategies used since the 50s to convince us to buy things, which then took on a new role for many other areas as well, helping to shape how we are today as a society. Although this book is about the US, it can be applied here as well. I'm only two chapters in and it's gold, covering the use of mass psychoanalysis to guide heavily funded research and campaigns within the commercial landscape initially and then increasingly in the political one. I'll share some key phrases with you. What the probers are looking for, of course, are the whys of our behaviour, so that they can more effectively manipulate our habits and choices in their favour. Very quickly after that line, he mentions it moving from the genial world of James Turber into the chilling world of George Orwell and his big brother. Indeed, he is correct about that as we see us around today, and especially with that particular book being mentioned a lot. But this next sentence stands out to me. Another aspect of people's behaviour that troubled marketers is that they are too easily satisfied with what they already have. They were concerned that although business was booming across the board, it couldn't be sustained unless you put more pressure on everyday Americans to consume more. In a 1955 Christianity and Crisis publication, they stated the following. The dynamics of an ever-expanding system require that we be persuaded to consume to meet the needs of the productive process. So, with overproduction threatening, they turned their attention, not to that they might be making too much. No, it was that the people were buying too little. Funny and tragic all at once, really with billions being poured into marketing, the phrase, we don't sell lipstick, we buy customers, came about. People became a bigger commodity then, I realised. But their biggest hurdle, it seems at first, was that after a time, most people really did have what they need. And if the products were any good, shouldn't need replacing every year. So, what to do? They went for the idea of creating psychological obsolescence to make people feel dissatisfied with what they have and want new. I wonder whether this is how that saying, keeping up with the Joneses came from. To encourage you to covet what someone else has, to think they have more or better and that you should have it too. That's really raged out of control now, hasn't it? We know they use whatever trick they can to get us to buy things, but it isn't just about the bottom line or money. It seems to be about controlling the way you think as with an awful lot these days. Bit more sinister than just buy my stuff, isn't it? The first fad. It's the 50s and marketers are trying their best and spending billions of dollars to work out and manipulate customers, to change the customer's habits and behaviors to better suit the corporation's needs rather than be there for the need of the people. My article Consumerism covers that a bit more. But within these times, technology moved along and a distinct marketing advantage came forth. Television. Huge resources were put into it, much as they are today. They wanted to use television advertising to get to a much larger audience and therefore number of customers, adults, and potential customers, children, and then something happened in TV that caught a generation's attention and gave them lots of data to work with apparently in unravelling how to create marketing situations on demand. Davy Crockett. The TV series happened and became hugely popular, leading to merchandise, leading to big sales for companies. Then just as they stocked up with more goods, it dropped off. This is apparently what led to them investing in fads, what causes them, how to maintain them and steer them in the direction required. 
being able to influence great numbers of people at once through clever and psychological campaigns. As you can imagine, it didn't take long for it to move into other areas, if it wasn't in them already. Military, political, education, medicine, and any industry they wanted to boost and use to infiltrate people's habits and wants. Entertainment was also high on their list, it would seem, with crazes and fads chucked at us left, right and centre thereafter. Television helped all that massively, because while they had already been using the media and propaganda for decades, this gave them a whole new reach, and quicker. Now the internet has increased that capacity to an alarming level, as has been shown by current events. The fact that recently we have been subject to a rather aggressive marketing campaign, whereby they readily admitted they had a whole team studying our behaviour to scare us into compliance, covered in my article Nudge Nudge. They didn't hide it, although didn't admit they had been studying this idea for quite some time. With many of the systems, procedures and protocols ready for this surprise emergency, as well as the coordinated media campaign and government regulations across the board in various countries. Another sign it was not random in any way, to me anyway. And really, as each country has reacted and we have been fed the media stories we are meant to read, things get pushed in a direction they would like, demanding everyone's attention, daily briefings, new rules every day, doom threats constantly, weekly clapping rituals, repeating certain phrases over and over, almost as one would expect when trying to hypnotise people and condition them to a new way of life. They say it only takes 90 days to form a habit, so the length of time imposed for various restrictions and hoo-ha was more than enough and some people would have been quite overwhelmed and shocked by the unfolding disaster which appeared to be around them, so would have been potentially in a more receptive state to hypnotic and coercive techniques. I wrote a piece about the coercion tactics, the three Ds of conversion, under coercion, for a little more on that. But we can see around us now that it is all out in the open, and the book I read to find out about all this motivational industry marketing is called The Hidden Persuaders, written in the 50s when this was unfolding in corporate America. Well, it is no longer hidden and isn't confined to America. Global corporations under the guise of international organisations have set their sights on a new fad and we are slowly moving through the phases of their marketing plan to cajole, coerce and convince the masses that it is all for the greater good. Of lining their pockets is the part they don't say. More taxes, more money, more richness, going all the way to the top. Literally starving and choking the people now while they take ever more. It's relentless and will continue to be until someone pulls the plug on the whole devious scheme to ruin people who have now served their original industrious purpose and now appear to be needed for their medical cannon fodder and constant surveillance plans seemingly using a constant stream of illegal immigrants as either a distraction, a replacement population, a waiting army, just to upset any local and community cohesion that could take place to fight back at the authorities. It's anyone's guess at this stage what their ultimate goal is for this strange situation we find ourselves in, and when it will turn nasty for them. We are encouraged to spend time trying to imagine how bad it is going to get for us with all the disaster films they have made, Prep for disaster or clever programming covered that a bit, so you don't need to even use your imagination. But more time needs to be spent on where it does go wrong for them, because things will change afterwards. They will have to. The old times and ways really are going to have to be left behind, but that doesn't mean you have to follow the sterile, monitored path they have waiting and are trying to steer everyone towards, making it seem as though that is the only way because it's what they have worked so very hard for and it's what they seem to want. But because everyone didn't just hand themselves over to their vision at the start of the pandemic, they now have to do it through crazy politicians stumbling over targets of net zero and a very driven marketing campaign of protesters slash actors and well-placed and timed events, steering and shaping society and opinions as they want them, introducing music, drugs, lifestyles, motivations, dreams, products, ideas, and all sorts of things they wanted you to be aware of, thinking and doing. 
Don't ever think they haven't thought about anything that is a public release item, whether it be a media piece or releasing biological agents on the unsuspecting public, like they also did in the 50s and 60s. They will have given it an awful lot of thought. The Mark of the Beast This title really shouldn't surprise anyone who has been paying attention. It's coming. At first through what looked like benign offerings of technology to make life easier, covered in convenience or dependence. But this is more than that. This is an intrusion into our bodies to make us literally part of their system. No longer a consumer or mere bystander, but assimilated with it. It seemed for the longest time the barcode was the representation of the mark of the beast, as told in the Bible, that no man shall buy or sell lest he have this mark. Each product mostly has to have a barcode these days, but you can still trade without it. So maybe money was the mark then. Without that you cannot buy or sell. But you can, because you can still barter and trade with goods, eliminating the money in the transaction altogether, just like the good old days. What they really seem intent on though, is eliminating people being part of a normal daily transaction, apart from the buying and consuming bit. A conveyor of customers that you can just scan. Do you not see the correlation? They scan barcodes of products to keep track of them and process them through a database of transactions for the purpose of analysis, usually for the purpose of continued marketing, i.e. are people buying that product? How much do we need? reordering, etc. So put yourself now as that product, with your inserted chip and barcode tag, slight upgrade from your national security number, although it will be tied to it, integrated with your digital ID. Once you start on that conveyor belt, you don't actually know where it goes, do you? And as they scan more people and analyse the data, they will adapt those systems for said requirement but as the algorithm interprets them from a robotic and sterile viewpoint. There will be minimal interaction with other people, unless they too are part of the conveyor. I know a little we've all secretly dreamed of having a shop to ourselves, or wishing that all the people would be replaced by machines so we didn't have to talk to anyone, or smile, or be polite, because sometimes we just aren't feeling it. But on the flip side, how many have just popped to a shop to be able to see and be around people? when maybe you aren't in the best place in your life. We used to joke about GP surgeries being full all the time because old people just needed someone to talk to, so they would be there. Not anymore, obviously, but the point being that people need other people for the most part. Once you are in the system though, by way of biometrics, facial recognition and digital ID, it will be very hard for you to be in control of your own life and make your own decisions. And maybe you struggled with those things anyway, and welcome the new way that is coming. But the majority do not seem to be on board, not voluntarily anyway. So they are trying very hard to coerce, blackmail and manipulate people into accepting their access systems, where they can get to decide what, where, who and when. It can seem scary I know to be responsible for yourself, your whole life and decisions. But what is even scarier is the thought of someone else doing it all for you throughout your entire life. The parent that just won't let go or ever let you leave home and needs to know what you are doing all the time and decides when you can and can't do things, decides what you eat, if you can work, etc. We used to call that controlling and abusive, but for some reason, because it is the face of a corporation doing it, people seem fine with it. And because they want to do it to everyone, that seems okay too for many. Just shocking. Behind these corporations are people. Greedy, manipulative people who are used to getting their own way and when they jump, they pay people to say how high. That's who wants to be in charge of your life. And little by little, they are being let in through the front door, being invited, just as a victim needs to invite a vampire into their home to give them extra powers. It seems to be the case here. So all I can advise is that people don't be so willing to be a product on the conveyor of consumerism. 
Because just as those things you used to scan were useful to you, you become useful to someone else. You just won't know why yet. The Digital Doomsday Database The name of the book should give it away really, and what its purpose was. The Doomsday Book. Also known as the Great Survey. That's that word, great again. Created over a thousand years ago in 1086, it was the first step towards where we are now in my mind. A register where everyone in the land of England was visited apparently, and all their assets, property, land etc were listed, so they could be taxed or taken off them. And tax people they did, for various things over the years, working out that it wasn't enough to only take on the main things, they needed to reduce people's wealth while at the same time as increasing theirs. Same shit, different day. We've had window tax, that many have heard of, and you can still see the remnants of that time, with bricked up windows and seeing where they once were. That's the only reason why I've heard of it. I asked as a child while they were bricked up windows in so many buildings. Another one I learnt of in the last few years was hearth tax. Yes, they actually taxed you on how many fireplaces you had or places to heat food, meaning you could have more than one family in a house. Yep, tax them. Suddenly films like Robin Hood don't seem so far-fetched. Well, maybe the bit about someone standing up to the establishment and getting things back in order, but not about taxes on the poor. That bit is very true, and of barons and lord of the manor, we still have them today. In these modern times though, they have been stealthily putting together their digital doomsday database of what you have and what you are. But is it just for taxes this time? They talk of you owning nothing and you being happy, so how exactly are they going to go about achieving that for you? We have the 10 year census which gives them all sorts of household and personal information. They can access your bank if they want, which shows them your financial life. They can check your insurance which tells them how much you have within your house and how much your possessions are worth. They know your political history through voting records, or lack thereof. They know what you learn and are educated with at school and university. They know your medical history and family situation usually. They can see what you buy at the supermarket, if you have a points card and use a digital transaction for it. They know where you socialise and when you use your card, and who you mix with and what you say if you do it via social media or your phone. They know what you watch, when you watch it, what you play, how long you play it for, what makes you stressed, what makes you happy, when you get ill, etc. It's a lot, isn't it? Has anyone in your entire life ever known that much about you? Or you about them? But all the above doesn't in itself mean something nefarious is going on. Even though it is no secret they spent billions of dollars in the 50s and in subsequent decades on psychological research to manipulate and change people's behaviours and habits and needs to make them that way. What does seem to be revealing the nefarious side of it all is what is now being proposed which involves all of the above. The drip feeding of what they would like to happen by way of digital control of your life and what's more terrifying than what they propose is that lots of people don't seem in the slightest bit bothered by it. But that could just be a result of the constant programming that occurs to try and make people more compliant. Check out my article Consumerism for a little more on that. They want to dictate what you can own, if you can have a house or a job, what you can eat, your food allowance. They want to decide if you are mentally and physically healthy. They want to tell you what is correct and what is wrong, how to think and what to think. Individuality, choice and free thought seems to be a real thorn in their sides. Not for the benefit of the people, but for the benefit of their systems and profits. And in order to maintain that and steer it where they want it to go, they need to herd people along a certain path. It's happened before, just in a more analogue way. After the first Doomsday Book, over the coming times, they restricted people, wrote new laws, boundaries, land agreements, taxes, systems of order to control people, creating slums and low wages between themselves to keep people in their place. If any section or peoples appear to be getting too rich or too smart for the liking of the others, they are removed, or discredited, or social strife is created to change the direction. Wealth gets taken and redistributed to those who want to keep it from others. Neatly illustrated these last few weeks with the changing of the monarchy in the UK. An article titled, The Royal Family Put Into Law in 1993 That They Won't Have to Pay Inheritance Tax So It Doesn't Erode Their Wealth. And there you have it. 
clear as day. Your wealth is up for grabs, but theirs isn't. And that, people, is how the rich got very rich. Not by working harder, but by keeping more and taking yours. Convenient disasters also clear the way for them. Industrial advances giving reason to clear out the countryside a bit, herd people into cities with the idea of wealth and fortunes. The streets are paved with gold, they said. And people believing in being able to make something of themselves with the opportunities of the city. Not so in many cases. It's the same then as it is now. It's who you know, not what you know. But those ideas were put out there because it served a purpose. They want people to move around and relocate, but when it suits them. Forced relocations have been a thing all over the world for the longest time. Ireland, apparently during the Great Famine of 1845, it wasn't just the lack of potatoes that caused the issue. The royalty at the time kept exporting food out of Ireland. They deliberately starved all those people and encouraged more to leave. Scotland, we had the Highland Clearances, only learnt about those fairly recently in life too. But again, families and generations of people forcibly moved. They say some of the clan leaders were in on it, bought out by pure greed. They increased the land rent to the point of being unsustainable to force people out. It worked. They crippled people's lives and way of life just to have some land and more money and power. Sad really that it has been going on for so long. But if you want to know how the UK came to be as it is today, I think it's important to try and look back over how we got here. Enslavement is not progress for us, but it may well be for the people who wish it upon us. So when they talk of technological advances and progress, they talk of their world. For us, it will be restricted living and being nothing but a resource for someone else and their way of life. And you must understand, both ways of life cannot coexist, it would seem, which is why one must go. Technology can still be used for good. I do believe that but not when wielded at the hands of madmen and their mercenaries. Monopoly. The game and corporations. Not everyone played or enjoyed playing Monopoly, the board game in their childhood. The game that could last for days, needed strategy and a want for money and property. A proper primer for the game of life you would have to play in later years. A banker in charge of all the money. They get to be the controller, the one who holds it all. How many of you liked being the banker? Did you also make a play for the high-end properties? Mayfair and Park Lane were the rich and luxury purples in the UK version. Bringing in the most revenue if you were lucky enough to be able to build your houses and hotels. But what the game doesn't teach you, obviously, is any shred of reality about how it actually works in the real world? And why should it? It's just a game after all. Maybe it would help people to understand how strange it gets in the real world though, if it was closer to the truth. When at first it seems like a normal setup with normal rules, like in the game. But if the banker halfway through the game suddenly decided you owed loads in interest and they could decide that rate of interest, it would change the game a bit, wouldn't it? and that they were going to charge you for just passing their coloured square, not even landing on it. You wouldn't want to play, would you? Because it would become obvious that the banker, or your opponent, was in fact doing everything they could think of to make sure they could take more from you than you can make. In real life, the systems in place are just obstacles that your opponent has placed there to hold you up, slow you down, and sidetrack you altogether. As we are seeing now in the economic landscape, they found a way to do a power move. I'll explain the chain as I see it, as I believe it's been with us for a while, but stepped up a gear when the pandemic rolled out. The first lockdown targeted small and family businesses, allowing franchises and corporation chains to remain open, then dishing out loads of money and loans, which would be payable, with interest, and would help later when they needed to move things along, either to tie people into new rules or to take them out of the equation. Changes in other local and national rules within the lockdown also screwed many, having to prepare for business, then be told at the last minute the rules had changed, allowing more cost and expenditure before they pulled the plug, coming down heavy-handed on those who tried to take a stand, imposing fees and fines. So much money being made from the misery of the country, and being funnelled where? Not back into the country, by any means. It would seem to have been a grand money laundering scheme, 
to take out as much wealth, savings, stability, community and future prospects that they can. And still it continues. Travel being disrupted still while they drag the Brexit drama along, adding more time and money to processes that have been mastered for as long as we could trade, but clogged up now with red tape and opportunists forever trying to get their peace, rather than make it work for all. And within the travel industry, we have a completely failing tourist industry, by design too of course. Although most of the hotels who were bought in the early days by government, whether they were just worried because they thought they would go down, or took the bank, or they want the country to fail, who knows for sure. But they are just there for current purpose, as I believe there will be no need for hotels with the future plan they have for this island. So it won't save them, just temporarily give them an income, while allowing the drain of the country's finances to continue. People shouldn't understate how important the hotels have been in this, as they have facilitated the rather large daily bill the government is covering, putting the debt further onto the people they are bleeding dry. The utility companies stepped up next to play their part. In a stunning display of greed, we get our household utilities increased at a stupid rate for no good reason. Cue the desperate business owners with bills higher than their entire turnover. Next wave of small businesses started to close shop, with stress after stress and no end in sight. I can see why some threw in the town. Then we get to the interest rates. A deliberate and steady increase in those too, helping anyone with savings and damaging those with interest-based loans and variable mortgages on the ground. Now after years of uncertainty, possibly grief and loss, losing your business and being unemployed, you then have to contend with losing your home or at least having the thought of that being thrust at you constantly. And in case you might have had a few spare pounds still, no fear, they increased all the other bills too and fuel to really make you feel the squeeze. Supermarkets came forth next to show it was going to be a coordinated effort. Price gouging and taking advantage of people when they are at a weak point economically, being quite the opportunist. All of them from what I can gather. Still sort of competing with each other, but really it seems more about how much they can add to the label before people stop buying the product. They have also played a key role in this being able to dictate and control people in the early days of this. Stickers on the floor, plastic screens, washing down trolleys, heavy-handed security, counting people in and restricting access. And even now, they quietly install their barriers, monitors, self-service tills and screens to watch you while you do your shopping, and to help be a part of the digital lives they want us all to lead. So, you can scan into the supermarket, just like all the other products in there. And politicians. Who could overlook their role in all this? It is now out there for everyone to see how self-serving they really are. Although having an allegiance to something, it is not the country they purport to serve. We have all been terribly misled over the years and duped into believing the setup in democracy and the rule of law. It's become starkly obvious that that setup was there to make them rich. Democracy was a cover to pretend they would agree to order and the rule of law serves them. And if it turns out there is a way to turn one to our advantage, they make efforts to change it. Again, to be in their favour, how can you get justice when they own the courts and the judges and write the laws? What we are subject to is a stunning display of grotesque corporate obesity, but they have gorged themselves on us for so long that they have lost sight of their toes and what is even real. No longer able to function properly or move, instead trying to consume more and more to sustain the morbid overload that is out of control. Each department of it acting as a distorted limb that can't hold up anymore under its own weight, grabbing at anything it can as a crutch, which too ends up being crushed under its enormous greedy mass. We would do well to try and remove ourselves from its reach or grasp and stop feeding it as best we can. I get the feeling it's reaching a critical mass at this point for their greed and our awareness so it will be an interesting time ahead.